hi friends. Uh, three years ago, in fact, almost exactly, it was September 2017, I reviewed a little film called Dahmer vs. Gacy, and uh, recently the director and star of the film, Ford Austin, got in contact with me, um, asking about potentially doing an interview, and I said, of course, of course I want to do an interview with the director of Dahmer vs. Gacy, so um, this is that, I, this is my interview with Ford Austin. Uh, I, I would first off like to apologize to Mr. Austin, <laughs> because, uh, my computer picks the worst times to have hiccups, so his audio is not very good. Um, especially right at the beginning. It gets better after, like, after, like, the first minute or two. It, it levels out a bit, but it still doesn't sound great. Um, I apologize, my bad, kinda. Really, my computer's bad, because my computer is bad. Um, also, in this interview, we do discuss some of the crimes of uh, Jeffrey Dahmer. So, uh, if you're particularly sensitive to sexual assault, here's a little timestamp when we talk about that. You can just skip right over it. Um, with that, please enjoy this interview. I had a lot of fun doing it, and thank you very much to Fort Austin for appearing in this interview. So I am joined today by Fort Austin, the director of Dahmer vs. Gacy, and Star. You, you played Jeffrey Dahmer, correct? And I played Ringo. And you played Ringo. So, yes, director I, Star so of Dahmer vs. Gacy. I produced, I produced it, and I wrote a lot of the additional dialogue. And, um, you know, like what we do with all those low-budget films... <laughs> Is I, I did all the costumes, I booked all the locations, I sat down at the end of every week and wrote out a payroll check for everybody. But um, you know, I didn't, I couldn't hire anybody to do it. It was just me making a movie, and um, outside of my camera crew and my stunt people, fight people, fight choreographers, I. And I think I kind of did most of it during production and pre-production. Hmm. I know, shocking that I would come up with such great quality, but you know, it was, uh, it was a really fun journey to make the film because there weren't that many of us that did it, and it was like we were making the script called Dahmer versus Gacy, and we knew exactly what we were doing, and you can see that in a lot of the dialogue. And I didn't really. I didn't cut any of the dialogue that the writer had written. Andrew Rouse wrote it. Mm -hmm. I didn't cut any of his dialogue, but I added a lot of scenes. And you, I think you'll be surprised to know the scenes that I added. Um, like you in your in your interview or no your review, you commented on Stephen Adler from Guns and Roses. <laughs> yes. Well, I just I wanted to address that part of that because that was kind that of, was one of the questions I had. It was kind of an interesting thing how it happened. Um, I was out at a bar in Los Angeles, and I saw this guy who everybody said, hey, that's, uh, that's Jamie Adler, that's Steven's brother. He really wants to talk to you because he heard about this movie Dahmer vs. Gacy that you were doing. And I was like, oh, I was finished with the movie. I mean, I was done, and I was trying to figure out extra scenes to shoot with Jeffrey Dahmer doing Jeffrey Dahmer shit because the script really didn't have any of that in there. Like, he wasn't eating anybody. He wasn't fucking anybody, excuse me. Um... So then Steven Adler's brother came up and he said, Hey man, I have got to get my brother in this movie. He loved that episode of South Park with uh, the serial killers as the three stooges. And if I get him in this movie, I'll just be a hero to him forever. So I said, okay, um, uh, sure. You know what? Let me think about it. And, uh, and I pretended like I really didn't care, but I was like, that'll be really cool. So then I, I, I cast Steven and we went to the four and 20 restaurant and we sat there and had some eggs and I'm like so what do you want to do in this movie because it's pretty much shot Steven and I, and I want you in there and he goes well man you know and he was like you know he was doing a celebrity rehab with Dr. Drew at the time mm -hmm. he's like well you know I'd really kind of like to I don't know I was just like I don't know man and I said well how about this you're in a bar <laughs> you're like doing coke in the bathroom and uh, Jeffrey Dahmer walks in and he abducts you and he takes you back to some basement where he drugs you and drills you in the head and, um, and rapes you. 
And he was like, yeah, man, his eyes lit up. <laughs> That'd be so cool, man. And, uh, and so we did it. And I got to tell you, man, he was one of the most professional people I had on the set. He knew all of his lines. He came dressed and ready to work. He was on time. And um, had a little joint with him. And I was like, you know, what am I going to tell him not to smoke the joint? I said, you know, it's fine. Your character will do that in the movie. And it was like he filmed this first day in the bar. And it was just like he showed up and he did it. And it was great. And then the second day we were going to do it in this other house in this creepy basement. And I was like, is he really going to show up for the second day? You know, because it was such a low budget movie. I was like, is he just going to kind of like lose the romance of it? And kind of, you know, a lot of people in these low budget movies, they decide not to come back after the first day when they see how low budget they are. Hmm. But he came back, came back and he, and he nailed it. And it was like, in my opinion, it's one of the best scenes in the movie because it's just like, I mean, I mean, it's not saying much, but you know, it's, it's, a, it's a good scene. That's that's an interesting story, like. Yeah, yeah, you know the story. The movie's filled with stuff like that, which was why I wanted to talk to you because, you know, when you make it like a film like this, most of the time it just is like you're making the movie and that's that, mm -hmm. and you just you shoot it and you don't care about it and you get it out and you cross your fingers that you can have a distributor, but with this, um, like the guy that played John Wayne Gacy was personal close friends with Jerry Marin, who was the last surviving munchkin from The Wizard of Oz. And he goes, let's get Jerry in the movie. And I said, well, I've got a mime role. Let's have him play the mime. Oh. And, uh, and I thought, that'll be really funny, you know, this little tiny munchkin mime and really tall, big John Wayne Gacy. And um, so that was another thing that happened. It was like this, all of a sudden, I was directing this actor who was... <laughs> In the Wizard. Of Oz. In the Wizard. Oh my God! So Stephen Adler over here, and the Wizard of Oz over here, <laughs> and and it, we were like literally guerrilla shooting that scene on the side of the street in Los Angeles. Like we didn't care, and he didn't care either. <laughs> you had a lot of interesting sort of like cameos and then uh, characters in there. You had like um, Felicia Rose of. Uh, Sleepaway Camp. Yeah, Felissa Rose was really one of my first people to choose. Have you seen a movie called Slaughter Party? I don't think I have, no. I'm not. Um, if you want to do a great <laughs> review where you're really just like going on, pick up Slaughter Party. You know, I may have a copy and I'll send it to you. It was We made it for $500 in the desert. We had Ron Jeremy in it. And um, I mean, it's the same kind of stuff. Felissa played the lead. And we had uh, Rick Drazen in it, Seymour Butts, who was the, the big porn star. Yeah, it's a little thing with all these things. It's like if always a porn star kind of pops up, but, you know, you, you go with it because it's a little bit of press. Mm -hmm. And Felissa was so awesome to work with. And that was like, again, I walked into the grocery store and I said, hey, can I shoot in this grocery store? And they were like, well, why don't you come back tomorrow at like 9 a.m.? We open at 10, but you can come and shoot for an hour. So I took like two crew members and her, and I mean, we just barely grabbed the scene, but I really wanted her in the movie. And that's also her husband that plays Charles Manson at the end, oh. Darren Miller from CKY. Um. She's awesome. Okay, yeah. Um, did you sort of, uh, did you sort of, worry about or were you, were you sort of hoping for people to find this kind of tasteless because it is about two real serial killers who really lived were you like yeah. okay like we know what we're doing because it does seem very tongue-in-cheek yeah well and, and you know that's kind of why the movie didn't really do better i think I mean, it's it's, also it could just be that it's like so low budget <laughs> and you can't um i went I'm, to a convention and I had a guy come up who was collecting serial killer, like business cards and art. Like he had little drawings by people and he was like all over it. Now it was at that point when I had this guy collecting real serial killer merchandise that I was like, man, I don't know. You know, it's like the families of the victims. And 
Yeah, I wasn't really proud of it in that moment. But then I thought, well, a lot of people responded to the movie and they enjoyed it. And they, there's people who, every movie finds its audience, right? So for me, I was fortunate enough that enough people found an audience, it found enough people to be an audience, even though it's, it's kind of like, not just tongue in cheek, but a little bit offensive mm-hmm. towards a lot of things to do with real true crime serial killers. Mm-hmm. Um, not just the families, but literally people who are like, well, this is hardcore true crime. You know, the movie Dahmer with Jeremy Renner or the movie Gacy or the movie this or that. Mm-hmm. I mean, those were like really true, like trying to like kind of scare you and, and be serious. This one, it threaded the needle in a different way where it was like a campy, low budget horror film. And we just had to go with it. I mean, I went the first training that we had at a convention in uh, Denver, I even put something in there that's, you know, Dahmer versus Gacy, just shut up and go with it. Because it was like, there's so many caveats there. Yeah, I mean, it was the title that drew me in. I'm like, I want to know what happens in Dahmer versus Gacy. That... <laughs> and you found out. Yeah. I mean, that's... Yeah, we, we, and we eventually wrote a sequel, Dahmer versus, Dahmer versus KC2 in space. And then in uh, 2011, I got in a car accident that put me in a coma in a wheelchair. And I was like, I signed the distribution deal for this movie from my hospital bed. And, um, you know, I could barely talk, and I was like, not coherent, but I wanted it to get out. And, uh, and then I said to the writer, I said, well, you should write this sequel so that we can start on that. And then I got in the car accident and obviously my focus was somewhere else. And then enough time went by that I got to see the amount of sales and the amount of interest. And for me to go down the path to do Dumber versus KC2 in space, it was not big enough of an audience to justify making the sequel. So I said, yeah. you know, I don't want to just spend 50 grand or whatever it is. Yeah, I, I, Would you think that somebody should make that? Do you think that <laughs> movie should exist? I want that movie to exist. I would watch that movie. Yeah. But I understand. <laughs> I'm, I'm not most people. If you want to, you know, make a profit, uh, I understand why you didn't go through with that. Cause I, even, if, even if it's not about profit, but if, even if it's like, let's try and get somewhere towards breaking even. But also, let's like have fun. I don't know that I could recreate that. Like, there was a, it was, it was a moment in time, and obviously now, um, I don't even know. I've sort of thought about it, and I still have the script over here, and I'm wondering should I do it at some point? You know, COVID hits, and I'm kind of like, well, now we can't even go into production. Um, and, you know, I think as long as I have the script, it might happen. It might happen. Uh, All right. Time, so, uh, <laughs> I I look forward to it if it happens. So I, I do hear a lot about like movies I have discussed and they had planned a sequel and then the sequel just never happened. So And again, it's probably because they didn't get it. You know, when you make a movie, you picture this huge response like we get for big Hollywood movies. Mm-hmm. And then when you sit down and you really do the numbers, all those movies behind you, all of those people maybe sold 5,000 copies at the most. So maybe a thousand copies. There was one person who got distributed at the same time as me, and I asked the distributor how many they sold, and he said 200. And I said, okay, so these people gave you a movie, you sold 200 DVDs. And that's when I was like, well, that's a real wake up call. And then you sit down and you go, well, okay, all the screenings that I ever had, all the everything. Now you've got Netflix and all the digital online stuff where you don't even sell a copy. You just do a deal and you get like a few pennies per view. How does an independent filmmaker do it anymore? How does an independent filmmaker get 5,000 views? Let's say it's $10 a view, right? $10 a DVD. Well, what does that add up to? Do do we have the collective mind ability to to make that, to know, know what that number is? 5,000 views times $10. That's 50,000. So $50,000, that's a, then that's a lot of views. Like 5,000 DVDs is a lot. Mm-hmm. So and I don't want to get too much into the, 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 the business of making these things, but 
God, if I could sell 5,000 copies of a movie right now, I'd probably make it. But then you've got all the stuff. With, if you're going to sell that many, you've got to get like somebody like Felissa Rose or some of those guys that played Freddy or like a Gunnar Hansen. Somebody even put on the box cover and say, okay, this guy's like somebody we all loved his performance. We want to see this guy do something amazing again. And uh, I was even having a talk with another producer. What if we were to get like somebody from each one of the franchises and put them all in there? And you've got this, this sort of battle royale of serial killers going around in the movie. Maybe people would watch it, but it cost me you know, like a couple grand a day per actor. So you really have to kind of like figure out how to shoot them out and keep it going and make it entertaining, right? <laughs> but we can go to that other times. Ask me more things about your. <laughs> tell me more about your your first responses to Dahmer versus Gacy when you saw it. Um, it's an interesting it's film a, to be sure. <laughs> it's 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 something because uh, the first time I watched it, I watched it with a bunch of friends, and I think that's sort of the ideal situation to watch it in because you put it on, and then they're like, "What are we watching? Why are we watching a movie about Jeffrey Dahmer and John Wayne Gacy? Why are there ninjas in it?" <laughs> it's it's a it's an odd movie, and it's fun to put on for people and just watch their reactions. So. It did turn out to be one of those things, right? It's like, how did this movie come to exist? Yeah. It's... But, you know, and the fact that I played both of those lead roles. You know, I, I remember, so first I had that long beard and the, and the hair and the denim jacket. And I shot, I scheduled it out for seven days with that character where we would just go around and shoot all his scenes. And it was in my mind, I, I thought, but I didn't know until I got to the scene because... I just, I didn't think about it, I didn't plan it out. But at some point, I had to kill myself in this movie. At some point, Jeffrey Dahmer had to kill this guy. Or no, Ringo had to kill Jeffrey Dahmer. So, I was in the same scene. So I, uh, I wound up, and, and it was like, I grew this hair. So, I couldn't like shoot coverage back and forth. So, I shot seven days, and then I literally walked off the set. And I, I drove to the barber shop, and they cut and dyed my hair and shaved my beard off. And I put on the Jeffrey Dahmer jumpsuit, and I went back to set, and the whole set flipped out because all of a sudden, like Jeffrey Dahmer had showed up on the set, and I was completely unrecognizable to what they were spending day in day out with, and um, kind of mocking because that character's kind of a foolish guy. Then I had to figure out real quick how to kill myself in the scene, which I figured out that day in that moment. I, I didn't even think about it before that scene. I just figured it out. Did you notice the guy that played X-13 in the movie? Um, uh, yes. He was in something else, but I can't remember right offhand. It was Neelix on Star Trek. Right. Yeah. And, uh, and he also played uh, Emmett Stone's father in... A Woody Allen movie like two years ago and then he also did well, this is cool he did a Moliere play like three years ago on Broadway with uh, who's the guy from the station agent and uh, Game of Thrones a wonderful talented actor who was also an elf um oh shoot um I'm blanking. Anyway. I know who you're talking about. You do, yeah. Really, really, one of, one of the most talented actors there is now. Mm -hmm. And um, Anyway, so Johnny Phillips, Ethan Phillips, played X-13, and that was this thing where I said, okay, you're this, this cloned material of all these super uh, killers, serial killers. I think that because of all your cloning, I want you to have a cross eye every time you look at the camera. Every time someone sees you on camera, you've got your eyes are crossed. <laughs> so this poor guy had to spend the whole movie like crossing his eyes for every shot. And um, talk about an amazing actor to work with. Ethan Phillips was a real kick. Hmm. Um, I want to ask, how much research going in did you do on... Jeffrey Dahmer or John Wayne Gacy? Because you do say in the film they're nothing like their real-life counterparts. They're just clones. 
Good. But I, I did do a lot of research for my character, <laughs> for the one that I had to play. That was Peter Dinklage we were talking about. Peter Dinklage, yes, thank you. The, uh, so the, the research that I did was I watched all the documentary footage about Jeffrey Dahmer that I could find where he was talking, where it wasn't someone talking about him. I did watch that stuff too, but there was this great series of interviews that I found where he was just talking about his parents. And I think one of his parents was in there in the chair next to him. And then I, I spoke to a couple of people who actually were living in that town during that time. And, you know, again, I was like, why am I doing all this? It's like, this is Dahmer versus Gacy. This is not like some serious Dahmer movie. And the guys that wrote it were kind of laughing at me. But, um, I, you know, I, I researched a lot of Gacy and his character Pogo and their killings. And I used to know the amount of people that they killed and, and all the circumstances around it. And right now, because it's like 10 years ago, the only thing that I remember about Dahmer was that there was someone who I, I met that said that um, he was at a bar in their neighborhood and that he had like taken somebody home and started to like rape them. And then that person ran out of his house with blood leaking from his anus and the police just laughed it off and they were like, oh, boys will be boys. And uh, didn't do anything about it. And later on, that guy got killed. All right. Um, I, mean, I, you know, I didn't really research for more than just the dialect with uh, Dahmer. And I wanted to be aware of things that, um, I, you know, I looked into some cannibalism stuff and I, and I looked into the method that he killed, which was why I added that scene with uh, Stephen Adler, mm -hmm. because he did use a power drill to drill their heads and pour a chemical into their brain to lobotomize them effectively so that he could use them as sex dolls. Mm -hmm. And um, beyond that, I don't really remember because again, it was 10 years. All right. Um, <laughs> but you did... More, yeah, you... more than you would think. Okay. Because um, you... I know you said you wrote a lot of the additional dialogue, but this was not your original script. No. This script was... This story, <laughs> the story was by... The idea was by Chris Watson. And um, the script itself was written by Andrew Rausch. And it's now it's on in the permanent collection of the Motion Picture Academy, which flips me out <laughs> that I got a letter in the mail from the the curator of the Academy of Motion Picture Television Sciences, Arts and Sciences, Motion Picture Arts and Sciences, saying that they would like to have a copy of Dahmer vs. Gacy in the permanent collection of the Margaret Carrick Library. And for me, I was just like, uh, okay, why? Why? Um, but I didn't ask that. I said, that's great. I'm going to send you the script. And so now it's in their permanent library. And it's, it's pretty astounding. Mm -hmm. So I think the original script was only like 68 pages. And uh, the rest of it was supposed to be kind of like long, overly drawn out shots. Shots that are indicative of low budget films where you like, maybe you'll have a guy walking to a 7-Eleven for 10 minutes of the movie. <laughs> or you'll have someone driving for a long time just to kill time. Yeah. So I wound up doing the Steven Adler scene that wasn't in it. And then the scene between uh, X-13 and Jeffrey Dahmer, where they're going back and forth and they're saying, I'm going to fuck you so hard. That you, I don't even remember what it was, but I think it was like 10 lines of dialogue. It was like basically mm -hmm. like a fuck you so hard fight. That whole thing was improv. We improv all those di all that dialogue. I'm going to fuck you so hard. A Donkey Kong machine falls out of your ass and it gets the top score, that type of stuff. No, that was written. Uh, it, the way that was written in the script is like he comes in and he stabs it, and that's it. Well, how did you get approached to do Dahmer versus Gacy? What was your reaction oh, to like, oh, I, uh... <laughs> yeah, that's a good idea. I, well, first of all, I didn't want to do it, and uh, Chris Watson and his filming partner Brad Paulson at the time approached me to play. Gosh, I think I was always scheduled to play uh, Jeffrey Dahmer. And, um, and they 
tapped another actor to play John Wayne Gacy, and they took photographs of it. And we did a photo shoot for, for cover art that could sell the idea to somebody. And then they could never get the movie going. It wasn't enough interest. So they just abandoned it. But I mean, I, I, I agreed to take the photo. And this was right after we did Slaughter Party, which is kind of why you need to go and find Slaughter Party. And uh, I think it might even be free on uh, YouTube now. It was for a time through Trauma. It's a Trauma release. Oh, nice. And <laughs> you don't hear that that much. But yes. Oh, Trauma. Nice. So it's, uh, but yeah, it was about that time. So they had convinced me to do a lot of crazy shit in that movie. And they convinced me to do at least the poster of the movie, Dahmer vs. DC. And back then I was like, yeah, this is no way, no way I really want to do this. And I mean, I mean, I came out of the New York theater scene. Like I was doing plays in New York City and I was trying to be sort of high-end actor in, in Los Angeles. I'd just done Pearl Harbor where I played a small role in that. And um, so like big, really big movies. And then... You know, I did Dahmer versus Gacy. You know, that's, that's that's how it came into my life, though. They tried to make it, and then they failed at it, and they just shelved it. And the script, they kept on calling me over the years, saying, "Hey, what about Dahmer versus Gacy? Why don't you make this?" And I was like, "Well, no, no, that's not time." And then after like five times of them asking, I said, "The only way this movie is gonna like the script is gonna get out of here is if I make the movie and the conversation is over." And they said. Absolutely. Make the movie. And I said, okay, I'll make it. So I cast it. And, um, you know, I think probably my favorite little Easter egg hunt casting is uh, the actress that plays the general who wound up playing the nun in The Nun. Did you see that? Um, I, I saw her in one of the Conjuring movies. I don't think it was The Nun. but uh, I'm, I'm aware she was in the Conjuring movies. Yeah, she was in Conjuring 2. Conjuring 2, she yeah. A, a real big hit with uh, James, the director. And um, she's a really good friend of mine, and I can't remember her name right now. But, and I still haven't seen The Nun. So, I can't, I can't, much, I can't say much about it. But it's like people like her, and then Art LaFleur is in there. And, um... Oh, it's Bonnie Aarons. Bonnie it's Aarons, my yeah. Friend Bonnie Aarons, and you know we became really close friends after that. And Erwin Keyes in there, who played the yeah. cop in the Warriors, and he was in a lot of other stuff. He's like a soda jerk in Friday the Thirteenth, which I really liked. Um, and um, uh, Harlan Williams is in the film, right? Harlan Harlan's a very good friend of mine. He and I did a movie with the director of Shrek, where we played brothers, and. I called him up and I said, hey, buddy, why don't you come over here and play God? And he, uh, he goes, yeah, all right, I'll come. Where are you doing my voice? I said, yeah. And he goes, ah, oh, fuck it. And then he goes, okay, why don't you come up to my house and, and, and uh, record, we'll record it there. Because it's just audio. It's, just, mm-hmm. it's not on camera. And I thought that it was funny because the dialogue in it, like he's really ribbing that guy Ringo. And I just thought, who better to do that than Harlan? Mm-hmm. Um, just and he hasn't. He hasn't really asked me to be in the sequel. Um, one question I wanted to ask you: uh, on your IMDb page, yeah. the picture you have is a man in a unicorn outfit. Is it you in the unicorn outfit, or is it yeah, someone else? No, that's me. That's my picture. <laughs> Okay. Um, I uh, so I made that as a joke with my friends, and then I just sort of sent it to my friends in an email, and then that was it, right? Mm-hmm. And then they go, you know, you should put that on your IMDb page, and I said, you know what, I will. And it was like a, a kind of a challenge, a yes challenge. I said, I will. They're like, no, you'll never put that up there, and I put it up there. And, you know, they have this thing called an IMDb ranking. So my IMDb ranking, you know, the lower it goes, like the lower your number goes, the more attention you get, right? So 
if you're like a new actor, your ranking will be like three million. And if you're like Tom Cruise, you'll be like one or two. Um, so I'm, I was always hovering around like 60,000, 50,000. So I put that on there and all of a sudden the number went to like 4,000. And I was like, wow. I can't leave this thing up there. The kids don't even take it down. So, but I left it up there for like a couple of weeks, and then it, and it stayed up at like 4,000, 3,000, 2,000. And then I took it down, and it went to like 60,000 again. I was like, huh, I liked it when it was really low. So I, I put it back up there, and it went back down. So it was like, okay, um, obviously this picture has some kind of power. Like people enjoy it. They like the attention of it. And um, and I just stuck it up there, and then I just said, you know, I forget it. I, I, and the whole concept of the unicorn for me just kind of said, well, if I want an independent filmmaker to cast me, I want them to feel like they really found a unicorn of an actor. So I left it up, and uh, and I, it did work. And I, was, I just shot a, a great movie called What's Buried in the Backyard with Richard Reilly from Office Space. And, Kenny Campbell from Armageddon, directed by Mike Blevins, and we just got distribution for that. So it's going to be going out in the U.S. and the U.K. and uh, about seven other territories. We're building more territories by the day, but what's buried in the backyard? Like he cast me off that because of the unicorn photo. So the mm-hmm. unicorn photo has got me a little bit of work, and uh, it's it's probably going to just stay up there because. All right, because right, I have known them. There, there have been IMDb pages I've seen get vandalized and people put pictures that aren't like the actor from the movie. So, yeah, and it, but it's it, you know this stuff is it's all about fun. It's like mm-hmm. we've got to, with all the stuff that's going on, like we've really got to figure out how to just laugh and have, have a good time. I mean, it's certainly interesting when someone tells you about a film called Dahmer vs. Gacy and you look it up and the first picture is a man in a unicorn costume. You're like, Even better, right? Even better, man. <laughs> it's great. Yeah. And then you can go through and you can see all that kind of stuff. The uh, Wizard of Oz and that guy is part of Guns and Roses and Harlem and Williams and so like mm-hmm. that. But the, uh, the, the most fun part about the movie was for about a month, I kind of became Jeffrey Dahmer. And I, I mean, I remember playing tennis with somebody and I was kind of picturing like eating them. And uh, it's the weird stuff, when you start researching roles like that, you start to really take on some of the character stuff. And um, that was really a dark period. It was very interesting because all of a sudden, all of these really dark desires happen, and um, and I didn't take it. I took it personally very seriously as an actor because I thought, well, the movies can't be, but I think around it, I have to be pretty serious about Jeffrey himself. Otherwise, it's just like I won't even want to watch it at all. And I knew that I had to watch it a lot in order to edit it. So, and actually, somebody. At a, at a big company in Hollywood, asked me if they could buy it and shell it and remake it. And I turned it down. It was a pretty big number. And I turned it down because of all the actors that had worked on the piece. I was really, really, you know, we were all happy with what we did. We had a good time, and the movie, you know, any performance in there that sort of feels like it's off or anything, it's all going to be my fault as the director because I specifically directed people to do crazy things at times. And um, like one of my actors, the, the, the main uh, scientist, Dr. Stravinsky, who was played by Peter Zmutsky, like I went out and I tracked him down and I, and I cast him. And I, you know, that guy was living in my house while we were shooting. And I was like telling him almost everything to do choice wise, like what I wanted, how I needed it. It was like painting a painting, it was like painting a fine painting. Dumber versus Casey is like a fine artwork. Is that a centipede on your? Who's, who's that? Who's that action figure back there? Uh, this is Schwarzenegger. I've also got I've got uh Jason Freddy right here, on a little plush. 
Leatherface. Excellent. Who was your favorite Leatherface? Um, Gunnar Hansen. I like the original. Yeah. <laughs> God rest his soul. Gunnar was a great guy. Mm-hmm. Any other questions um, about it? Any other? Well, uh, tra- <laughs> you, want tra- you want to trash it a little bit? You can trash it a little bit if you want. You can mock it a little bit. But well, um, just is there anything else about the the film you wanted to say about making it? Um, did it seem like it was too long? <laughs> <laughs> There were maybe a scene or two that I felt were too long. Yeah, like, I agree. Um, I mean, you were talking about improving the all the ways I'm gonna fuck you in the ass. That could have been like three, four lines. It yeah. went on too long. Uh, you know, I, one of the things I really liked doing in it was the ninja fight. And I'm sorry I didn't shoot that better because, you know, at the time I was making the movie, I hadn't really directed many fights on film. I'd done stage combat on stage, but directing fights on film is a totally different thing. So I think that what it did is it, it kind of affected the way that the editor was able to cut it. And um, that's why it's kind of like a music video. It's not very realistic. I would have really liked to have been able to make a fight like something out of a Jason Bourne movie or something really more uh, like we traditionally see. Something from Bloodsport. Or uh, hmm. even like Enter the Ninja. I, I'd love to have some kind of ninja fight sequence like that. And um, we had four great ninjas, and uh, it was. I actually cut one of the guy's shoe off with the sword. He did a flip, and he came too close to my sword, so I, I cut the bottom of his shoe, and his shoe just split right off his foot without cutting his foot. So that was a pretty fun moment. <laughs> and uh, that was a really good actor so we went with it and he survived it was fun it was, it was all that fun and for me to like go and fight ninjas in a movie that I'm also like playing Jeffrey Dahmer in well it was like I kind of got everything in that movie didn't I and uh, yeah. I mean uh, it seems like it would be like... nice if more people had seen the movie I mean more people yeah. like, I wonder how many people actually saw it um, do you think I should put it out? Because I, I got the rights back to it. I could do another run of it and put out some more DVDs and try and put it on Amazon or something. Uh, I don't know. There might be some interest in it. I I mean, the title is a big draw. So, like, basically the title is where it starts and ends for everyone. Either you want to watch Dahmer vs. Gacy or you don't. Yeah. And I think a lot of people don't. <laughs> Uh, and that's like why we have to like put it on the TV and have, hey, just watch this. Um, <laughs> and just keep it going. You know, I mean, it might have been better as a short film, but I wouldn't have fit all those pieces into there. And if I do decide to do the sequel, I will release, I will do a re release of this one and uh, sort of put it out ahead of the sequel just to restart all that. Because honestly, like, like I said, I was in a hospital bed when I did the distribution deal. So my whole experience of the movie getting released on DVD and in stores, I was in a wheelchair. (laughs) Like I was at my house in a wheelchair for the rest of my life. That's what I was going to be doing. Doctors gave me 1% chance of survival after the car accident. They said I'd never walk again. And I wound up doing all of that and more. And um, obviously going back to making movies, but, you know, during the time of the release, which maybe like 12 months, last maybe like nine months, is really like, we really are getting the movie out there. I was paralyzed in a wheelchair, and I was just like watching people go to screenings, watching people do signings. Like, my actors all did a signing of Dark Delicacies in um, Los Angeles at Burbank, and they like they're like sending me videos of it while they're signing all these DVDs, and it was all to raise money for my medical bills, <laughs> which it didn't even come near touching it. But and that would be the reason to do like a re-release of it, so I could really enjoy the process with everybody and sort of enjoy the audience, <laughs> the fans, man, fans. All right. 
Um, well, that's really all I have. Uh, I, th- I thank you very much for the interview. If you got anything well, else. Listen, listen. I want to thank you for picking the movie up and watching it, okay? I want to thank you for taking the time to give your honest interview, review, and putting it out there. Because this is like, I mean, you're, you're using a lot of time doing this. Mm-hmm. And uh, to take that movie into your psyche and digest it and put it out, and whether it was like something that you think is worth watching or something that's not worth watching, it doesn't matter. I'm just so honored that you watched my movie. And that's why I wanted to come and thank you there and just sort of tell you stuff about it. And uh, if, you know, any of my other movies you watch, I'll, I'll send them to you. I've got a couple of better ones. Uh, the worst ones. The, there's there's one. It's called like Aliens versus a Holes, and the description on IMDb is just Star Wars. That's what it says. <laughs> it, it like the description on IMDb is about like Jedi Luke and teaming up with Han Solo and Obi Wan Kenobi, and I'm like, is that the is this a Star Wars parody or wow. did no, someone just actually, put? This, the, so that was that was the first uh, the first sort of genre film I made. It was a series of shorts. And I hosted it, and it's uh, it was basically Felicis in it, and um, a couple of other great people are in it, and I, you know, I basically made a series of short films where it was an alien probing people, part of an Area Fifty One project, and um, and the joke again just kind of ran too far. That was actually what led up to all, all those other movies because producers liked that series. You know what I'll do is I'll, I'll get a copy of it to you, and they wound up they wound up creating a DVD out of it, putting it out, and then they wound up giving me a job directing a couple of features. Now that movie was shot on a DVX 100A 24 p camera back in 2001, so it's standard definition and it's all really, you know kind of low res, but you can watch like a couple of shorts and then be fine with it. You wouldn't have to watch the whole thing. Alright. Well, thank you very much for, yeah, for, for the interview. I appreciate it.